Okay, we're back again. More anthroposophy. All right. Now, it's useful, or at least it has been for me, and I'm trying to help other people. So it seems to me it might be useful for you as well to spend a little time with this interesting translation problem of the term Erkentnis or Erkennen or whatever that is in German into either knowledge or cognition. Now when the particular individual who pointed this out to me, who was a Central European and, and had lived in America for some time, and he actually said this in a branch meeting of the Faust branch, uh, when he said that, uh, that it was better, he thought, for English speakers to use the word cognition rather than knowledge because there was a tendency to think of knowledge as something passive, whereas cognition is active. And what lives in the term or Kentness in German is this sense of active. So we can have maybe a passive perceptual thinking or an active perceptual thinking and that this activity, this cognitive activity, can be very important to understand. Uh, now, just to jump way ahead in a way, if you read Owen Barfield, for example, and find there somewhere a, a definition of living thinking, he will say, well, it's about the will. Okay. And in my writings where I talk about living thinking, I, I use the phrase sometimes will-in-thinking, the will in thinking. And of course this is activity, this is what was trying to be conveyed by the German speaker who was trying to help us understand. Now, it's also possible, and I think consistent with the German, to use the word knowledge but when we do that, if we want to say, you know, if we read a translation of the first leading thought and it says, path of knowledge, then it's important to make the effort to try and get inside Steiner and see it from his point of view. Because in the GA 2, 3, and 4, the books on epistemology that Steiner wrote, that's what he's writing about. He's writing about the problem of knowledge. And in one of my earlier uh, videos where I talked about this question of the meaning of anthroposophy, uh, I said, and it's worth bringing up here again to weave into the, where we're going with this, is, is that uh, where Steiner found himself was in a situation where human consciousness had entered into existence in such a way that there was a split between thinking and experience and the evidence of this split is in a lot of the Central European philosophical and English and even American philosophical um, thinking. That This idea that my thinking, my personal thinking is, is disconnected from the world, from the world outside me and perhaps from the world inside me, which I only know vaguely, given the orientation of my eye toward the sense world. We are kind of drawn into the sense world by the necessity of our biographies. And we're going to come back at this in a little bit about the uh, exceptional state and turning around inside yourself. Okay, so let's work very carefully, very slowly. Steiner notices that consciousness is inserted into the world in such a way that the world itself comes to us from two directions. One direction is through the senses and the other direction is through that activity that we call thinking. And in modern times that is assumed to be an unbridgeable division. And one of the reasons natural science takes the course it does is because 
the seeking of natural science is for a universal knowledge of the world, of the senses, and ultimately of the world of consciousness, but of the world of experience, you might say, <coughs> that overcomes the difficulty that's perceived because we are a thinking subject. Our subjectivity enters into our perception and our thinking and natural science was worried about eliminating that subjectivity because it was fairly clear that we'd just end up with chaos. We wouldn't have science. We wouldn't have any way of agreeing with each other about things that might or might not be facts as long as our subjectivity could rule our perception and our thinking. And these were real problems for natural scientists and a lot of philosophical thought has concerned itself with that. Now, I'm not going to go into the history of that. I don't know the history of it very well. I can't do Steiner. I can just do Wendt. But I know it's there. Personally, I get better about certain things from Barfield. And, of course, there's always riddles of the soul if you want to get sort of a different click on all of that because Steiner there goes into different things or from the same problems uh, from a different point of view. So now we have this problem of knowledge. First leading thought can be read anthroposophy is a path of knowledge, but if we go to Steiner's way of thinking about what he means when he's using the word herkentness or knowledge, in the sense that it can be translated as knowledge, you might say, he means something that he talks about in the GA 2, 3, and 4, where he talks about the problem of knowledge. And what I said earlier was that he discovered that it was possible for the human being to bridge this apparent gap through our activity, which really comes down to through the metamorphosis of the given nature of our thinking, we can heal the gap between our subjective experience and the world that we presume to be objectively there. And there are a lot of nuances to this. Theory of Knowledge points out some of them, and Owen Barfield has a nice essay called Rudolf Steiner's Idea of Mind. And what I'm going to do is uh, go into that next. But first I just want to make sure, sure we're on the same page here, what we're talking about. We're talking about the problem of knowledge. We're talking about the fact that we are a subject experiencing... Uh, what seems to be objectively cognizable and natural science tries to objectively cognize or think about the world through the senses and then build up pictures that lead to our understanding of our human nature and our consciousness and so on and so forth. You can trace the history of natural science and you can see all this delightful work as it tries to solve these puzzles and to solve these puzzles against a background in which Human thinking is suspect, so in order to generate shared thinking and shared concept, science establishes a lot of its methodologies, its experimental methodologies, its peer reviews, its all of the ways in which it says we're going to try as much as possible to remove the subjective element of the individual and find some kind of collective understanding of the world. I'll be back.